I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers in a second, but I wanted uh, to give Rick Grove, uh, a friend of the, a close friend of the Institute who inspired us to have this session, um, uh, the opportunity to say something if he would like to. Okay. Nice. Um, I don't think I, oh yeah, okay. Um, I am um, a member of the Institute. I have been a member of the Institute for 30 or so years. I'm also very privileged to be a member of the International Advisory Committee for Friends of the Earth Middle East. And most of us tend to look at issues of strategy and environmental issues in separate silos. It's rare that we think of them together. But having been in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan this summer, it became apparent to me that there's absolutely no separating these issues uh, when it comes to the Middle East. And um, uh, looking at the work that I was privileged to, to, to view this, this summer, the work that FOMI is doing on the ground in, in these three countries um, is remarkable. Um, the, the, the rehabilitation of the Jordan River which they will, I, I think, talk about. Um, you get a sense for what it's going to take, not just in, in terms of security and not just borders, but all sorts of other issues that, that tend not to be as, as, you know, as discussed. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to bring these two disciplines together, environmental issues and, um, and strategic issues. Um, Steve and I and some of the others in this room were privileged to be in Stockholm uh, weekend before last at the Global uh, Strategic Review that was hosted by the, uh, the IISS. And the Norwegian foreign minister um, delivered opening remarks, and we had a chance to, to speak with him afterwards. He said that for the first time, and he's been visiting the region since the Oslo Accords, for the first time in 20 years, he came back from the Middle East more optimistic than when he went. Now, he didn't say he was optimistic. He didn't say that peace was a certainty, but he said that the needle for the first time is moving in the right direction. And so I think this is a very appropriate time to, to, to hear what these gentlemen have to say about uh, what they're doing on the ground. And the work that they're doing together is exactly what will need to happen many times over if we're truly to have a, a, a peace settlement, which I think uh, all, of us, uh, all of us hope for. So with that, let me turn it back to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which, uh, in which they'll speak. Uh, 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 the first two will speak for about 10 minutes apiece. Um, uh, the second two, perhaps a bit shorter, I'd like to allocate at least half of the time we have available to Q&A. Um, so well, that means that uh, we really have 30 minutes for the speakers to, um, uh, to make their case. Uh, our first speaker is Guidon Bromberg, uh, who is an expert on water, peace, and security uh, issues um, and is affiliated with Friends of the Earth Middle East. Uh, he's uh, particularly um, uh, interested in water, obviously, but he's been an advisor to a range of multilateral and multinational uh, forums and commissions relating to environmental issues. Uh, so uh, we're very eager to hear what he has to say, and he'll start off with a 10-minute uh, or so um, uh, presentation, slide presentation, that will have uh, pictures as, as well as words to give us a context for this. Uh, uh, following Guidon uh, will be Ambassador Oded uh, Iran. Uh, he is a long-term diplomat, uh, suffice it to say, with quite a distinguished career from 2002 to 2007. He was Israel's ambassador uh, to the European Union and also accredited to NATO, and before then he was the Israeli ambassador uh, to Jordan. Uh, he's held senior ministry uh, positions as well, including deputy director general. He's now head of uh, the INSS, which is sort of like an Israeli equivalent of the IISS, uh, focuses on strategic uh, studies and produces a lot of really first-rate, um, you know, cutting-edge analysis, especially of security and political problems relating to the region. Uh, he'll be followed um, by Nader al-Khatib, uh, who uh, is part of the newly established Water and Environmental Development Organization. He served as a consultant to many international development organizations uh, as well. Uh, he is now uh, the director 
of the Palestinian branch of Friends of the Earth Middle East and is a technical expert on uh, water and sanitation uh, engineering problems. Uh, finally, uh, co-founder of Friends of the Earth Middle East, Munkath Mehyar, um, uh, is also the founder and director of the Jordan Society for Sustainable Development, which is an environmental NGO in Amman. Um, uh, he uh, is an expert on these matters and regularly consults and speaks on them, and he'll tell us something about uh, uh, and, and he'll tell us something about um, the Jordanian stake in this issue. And lastly, I just want to clarify that uh, Oded uh, has been demoted. <laughs> um, he's been defrocked. He is no longer the, the director of the INSS. He's now a researcher. Senior. Uh, a senior. <laughs> no, of course. Um, in, in our think tanks, IISS is no different than others. If you're a researcher or a fellow, you are a senior researcher <laughs> and fellow. Um, the only junior researchers are in obscure Oxford College common rooms. Um, okay, Guidon, over to you. Uh, wonderful. So I uh, will need to stand in order to operate this, and maybe the gentleman will want to move your chairs a little bit back so you can see the slides. Okay. We know them by heart. You know them by heart. Um, so firstly, uh, Equipeace Friends of the Middle East is a regional organization. It's the only regional organization that exists. I'm the Israeli director, not as the Palestinian director, Mukas the Jordanian director. We're one group with one vision, with one objective. Um, what we're presenting today is a vision to move forward on water. And we're very, very lucky that we've, we've worked together with the INSS in doing a strategic assessment. We did a simulation together as to how possibly we could solve water issues in the peace process. And water is not just any issue. Water is a core final status issue. And therefore, the bottom line is, we believe we can solve that issue today. We couldn't two or three years ago, but we can today. And therefore, we must stop holding water hostage to a failure in moving forward on other issues. Of course, if we can move forward on all issues, let's do it. But if we can't, then let's not uh, hold back on water and help water, uh, well, allow water to uh, create the trust needed to move forward on the other issues. So this is, of course, what we're looking for. It's that handshake. Uh, we're looking for the Palestinian uh, Israeli handshake on the White House lawn. Whoever uh, will be the, uh, uh, the president. Um, but we think that the approach needs to change. And Oded will speak to a paradigm shift um, uh, that, that we think needs to take place. Um, the water uh, resource issues in the Middle East are not surprising. Um, natural water is scarce. And we need to uh, move beyond the notion of just natural water if we're to advance towards solutions and those opportunities are at our door today, um, but the water resources that we do have, the natural water resources, are interdependent, and that has implications, not only for sharing of natural water, but to the third point, to the pollution uh, of uh, scarce uh, natural water. There is unequal distribution uh, in the region as a whole, partly due to climate, but in the Israeli-Palestinian case, very much due to the interim water accord where a fixed interim allocation was agreed to that was supposed to only last five years, and 20 years later, we're still stuck there uh, and haven't moved forward. Um, we're talking about the shared water resources of uh, basically three systems, the coastal aquifer shared by Israel and Gaza, the mountain aquifer shared by the West Bank and Israel, and we're focused on the lower Jordan River from the Sea of Galilee uh, to the Dead Sea. The current uh, water arrangement has been dictated, has been agreed to for an interim five year period under uh, Oslo II. Um, on paper, it looks like an equal system where there is uh, an equal number of Israelis and an equal number of Palestinians, and they're supposed to decide together on all water and sanitation issues. The reality has been, however, uh, very different. 
um, uh, the, share, the, the jurisdiction of what was created, the Joint Water Committee, only focuses on the West Bank side of one shared body of water, which is the mountain aquifer. So imagine a swimming pool or a bathtub with two straws and an imaginary line in the middle. The agreement is, is actually meant that it takes two people to drink from the straw on one side, on the West Bank side, while on the Israeli side, you're free to drink as much as you like. You don't need an agreement. And of course, you have ramifications. If, if you drink more on one side, it's going to reduce uh, water availability on the other side. And then there's a second layer of agreement when we're dealing with Area C. It's not enough that the, that the Joint Water Committee agrees on a particular water or sanitation project. As, lo as soon as you touch Area C, it requires the agreement of the civil administration of the Israeli military, um, which is a second layer of, of great complication in moving projects forward. And the reality on the ground that Nada will talk about is every home throughout the West Bank and Gaza has, uh, it was very much the West Bank, has water tanks. Um, don't expect uh, running water 24-7. Nada will speak to that. Um, water tankers are also a very common site uh, uh, throughout the West Bank for communities that are not connected to water at all, to water infrastructure, and of course to those that even are, but uh, don't have sufficient water to end the month. Um, the, this is a map of our uh, uh, water basins, and you know, to the uh, west of, of the Jordan River here, you can see that the green line makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, um, because the basins speak to, uh, to speak to nature, speak to uh, the, the way that the water flows. Um, and therefore, when we're dealing with sanitation issues, because the West Bank is high country and Israel is low country, um, uh, sewerage flows uh, to Israel. Um, and that's a major issue of concern. Uh, there's uh, only one large functioning sewerage treatment plant for two and a half million Palestinians on the West Bank in Elbira, a second plant has just been completed uh, in West Nablus, but still not uh, operational. There's some 52 million cubic meters of untreated sewerage um, that's polluting uh, a shared groundwater on the Palestinian side, flowing uh, onto Israel and then into the Mediterranean. So the bottom line, as we see it, and here you see a tour to Hebron Stream, is that the current arrangements of water have really completely failed the interests of both peoples. It hasn't provided enough water for the Palestinian side, and it's left raw sewerage, and in the case of Hebron, not only domestic sewerage, but industrial, toxic, uh, including cancerous chemicals, uh, flowing uh, in streams, risking Palestinian communities, Israeli communities, and uh, uh, the Mediterranean as a whole. Um, other streams, and literally they're flowing through the major cities, the Hebron Street close to the middle of Beersheba, the uh, Nablus Alexander Street next to Netanya, uh, the Kishon to the middle of Haifa, um, real implications for uh, people's welfare and people's livelihoods. Um, but the reality has really changed in these last years because of technology and leadership, and in this case Israeli leadership, in desalination and in treatment of wastewater. Um, over uh, these last four years, uh, we see a tremendous increase in Israeli desalination technology. And Israel uh, is today desal desalinating 550 million cubic meters of seawater, an additional 50 million cubic meters of saline water. So we're talking about an addition of 600 million cubic meters of, uh, of water to the economy, which because Israel is a leader in the treatment and reuse of wastewater, it's actually an addition of a billion cubic meters of water. If Israel's water economy just three years ago was two billion, today it's three billion. And uh, that creates really new opportunities. It means that sharing water more fairly comes at low political cost because political cost, there's an economic cost, because there isn't a sector that is going to be called on to reduce their water demand. 
and traditionally it's been the agricultural sector that had been called upon. Well, that scenario um, uh, uh, no longer uh, exists. So we're coming and saying that the opportunity is there on the table, and in order to institutionalize that opportunity, we're calling for a revitalized joint water committee that looks at both sides of shared water, in fact, all uh, shared water, and we'll, we'll also, I think, uh, Morgan will also mention uh, uh, the opportunities here of including also uh, the Jordan River and uh, a third party presence in order to overcome uh, failings uh, of the current Jordan, Joint Water Committee with three guiding principles, and I'll finish with that, um, uh, to uh, how to manage shared waters. Efficiency, a principle that very much speaks to Israeli interests. Israel is probably the most efficient water user on earth. And <coughs> principles of, of efficiency calling on both sides to be as efficient a, a, as possible to deal with the leaks that you mentioned, which can come to 40% on the Palestinian side, uh, needs to take also considerable investment. And equitable allocation very much speaks to a Palestinian demand. The current 80-20 divide uh, is not sustainable. It needs to be uh, uh, divided in a, in a fairer fashion. And finally, sustainability, uh, ecological sustainability. It's not a pie just to divide between the two peoples. Uh, uh, water also needs to be left in nature, the Jordan River, uh, for example, to sustain uh, the whole water uh, ecosystem and life cycle as a whole. So I uh, leave it there, and I think uh, we're dead. Thank you, Dina. <clears throat> there are photographs on the walls of two people who were uh, secretaries of state. Uh, one is here, the, the other one is behind you, yeah. on the list of rice. Both of them are not responsible for a comprehensive peace treaty between Israel and one of its neighbors, although Kissinger was the architect. The benefits were, or the fruits were reaped by Carter. Uh, the Lisa Rice didn't even come close. And I submit to you this afternoon that it is, in spite of the beginning of the talks, two months of the nine have already passed. I don't happen to believe that there is a comprehensive piece around the corner. The issues uh, which are called the core issues, Jerusalem refugees, and uh, borders are, uh, the, the gaps in the positions remain as they were in, in the past. I hope to be wrong, uh, but I don't think I am. And uh, therefore, and Guido mentioned it, I would like to speak of a change in paradigm and to explain uh, why and what does it take. The three major uh, negotiators involved, the U.S., Israel, and the Palestinians, are not there. They are still working on the assumption of a comprehensive peace at the end of nine months. What exactly do they mean by a comprehensive peace? I don't know. Uh, whether it is a framework agreement, or is it a real detailed agreement which will cover all the details? which will make it even more complicated uh, to achieve. But there it is. This is how they define the current attitude to, uh, to the negotiation. The problem is that there are issues that can not wait. Uh, Guido mentioned uh, two of them, uh, but they are, the, not the, they are not the only ones. Uh, water and environment are really pressing issues, but there is also the economic aspect, uh, the building of uh, uh, reliable Palestinian uh, government with more authority uh, to prove to the Palestinians that there is a way forward. Now what is the problem for the three in shifting their paradigm or changing the paradigm and talk about what is doable, not forgetting the two-state solution? I'm not saying that the two-state solution is not the solution. I'm saying it is. And it should remain because uh, if it isn't, uh, at least my own state uh, will suffer dramatically from uh, the 
elimination of that option, and I hope it remains very much on the table. For the United States, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if the two sides decide that this is what they want, the United States will help them get there. Uh, I guess so. For Israel, there is a problem, I admit, because uh, not only because of the uh, current political structure or map uh, of the Israeli political arena, which makes it very difficult uh, for the Prime Minister uh, to reach a comprehensive agreement. By the way, I will make a personal remark on the Prime Minister. I think that he is on the beginning of their road which people like C.P. Livni, Ehud Olmert, Dan Meridor, to mention just a couple of them or three of them, have made, because all of them come from families, from parents who were on the extreme right and uh, are now very close to, uh, if not in the middle of the Israeli political map when it comes to the whole Israeli-Palestinian issue. I think he's in the beginning in the sense that he understands what I just said, that the only uh, solution for the state of Israel is the two states. Uh, implementing it is a different story. Now, so for him, first of all, for personally, it is uh, difficult but doable. Secondly, when he comes to the Knesset and said, well, here is an agreement which I reached with, with, with the Palestinians, on water, the economy, maybe more powers in Area C, whatever. He has to explain to the right, why did you do it? What did you get for? And it's very difficult because the, the only thing that the Palestinians can give in return for the tangibles that Israel will give in, for reaching an agreement is the end of the conflict. And why would they give it if the only thing they get is a partial package, not the complete package that they would like to see or even close to it. So this is the difficulty for the for the Israeli political leadership to go for partial agreement. For the Palestinians it's not less complicated. Let's say that Israel for the sake of making progress towards the two-state solution says okay we are willing to give you much more water than you got uh, before uh, then Iran and Gideon Bromberg show us what you want to do, we'll do it, uh, uh, and uh, more territory in Area C where Israel has today full uh, powers, both civilian and uh, security powers, and even in Jews, in the uh, Arab suburbs of Jews. But then there is a the fear of the Palestinians that uh, once this agreement is achieved, the Israelis will say, well, let's meet in 25 years, see how it works. And whether we meet or not is a different story, and what will happen in 25 years is another story. So there should be a way of saying to the Palestinians, yes, we go for partial incremental agreements. However, these will be uh, connected, legally speaking, to the comprehensive solution uh, as a goal. You can do it in several ways. I don't rule out even going to the Security Council and reaching some sort of a, a sort of auspices uh, or, or uh, giving a sanction to such an agreement saying it's not the end of the road, it is part of the road to the two-state solution. So this is uh, how we see it, uh, and we see the benefits in this, uh, not only because if you agree uh, with us that there are no bright prospects of reaching a comprehensive solution at present, this is a, the right step towards a, a comprehensive solution, not, the whole, not attainable now. Secondly, it creates, the, the agreement itself, the implementation of it, will create greater confidence between the two sides. It does not end the negotiation. It does not end the road to a uh, comprehensive peace. And it brings a dramatic change to the life of the, mostly the Palestinians, uh, but to some extent to the Israelis as well, uh, to the Palestinians because the quantities of uh, water available for consumption will grow in a very serious way. 
For the Israelis, the very fact, I mean, uh, Gino spoke about the, the, the sanitary uh, issue, the environmental issue. I recommend something which I did together with Gino. We went to uh, see the tanneries in Hebron, which release on an hourly basis quantities of water and chemicals which are used in the tanneries. And I'm telling you, you get sick from looking at the water, not even touching it. And these waters, contaminated waters, run all the way from the hills of Hebron, 1,000 meters above sea level, all the way to the Mediterranean through Israel, through the Palestinian villages, open. Uh, there are fruit trees growing there on the Palestinian side, two meters from the, from this stream. I don't know how on earth, in earth, under the earth, we are willing to accept it. I just don't understand. Uh, and so I think that this issue cannot wait. I understand the suspicions, the fears, but the way to, do, to go forward as, as, as I as, as we believe, is to start with these issues and build towards the uh, two-state solution. Thank you. Thank you. Nader. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, I'm Nader Khatib. I'm from Bethlehem. And I've been in this water sector for more than 30 years. And for me, I think it is the same story. What I learned or faced 30 years ago in terms of water, we face it today. That is, I was appointed as a chief water and sanitary engineer for Bethlehem, water supply and sewerage authority. And on every Saturday, the director, my boss, will not come to the office. Why? Because tens of refugees from the Dehesha refugee camp will come to the offices, to the water authority that day, shouting, fighting, want to damage, you know, everything because they are not receiving enough water. Giving the reality that I am a refugee and I studied in the Dehesha refugee camp, so I have to face that every Saturday. At least, you know, to be with the people, you know, to build the confidence they can understand. But the majority never understood why there is no water. We look to the nearby settlements, we go to Israel, water is for there. It's the same story until today. There are demonstrations in the, way, in the West Bank. The last was just last month in Hebron, where thousands were demonstrating, not against the Israeli army, against the PA, in particular against the Palestinian minister of water, because they are not getting water. And for those people, they don't know that, you know, the PA is handicapped, the minister doesn't have water, how the arrangements in Oslo. But for them, you know, they want to drink. They cannot wait until, you know, there is a final peace agreement, until there is a solution to everything. These people want to drink. They cannot continue suffering. So the other thing also, my first experience, you know, such meetings 25 years ago, the first debate, with an Israeli expert named Elisha Kali. You know, he was an expert even before I was born. He's the one who came with the suggestions of the peace pipelines or diversion of the Nile to Gaza. And he also was from the right wing in Israel. You know, and that the argument was that, you know, it is a zero sum game. If Israel wants to give more water, then there will be no water in Tel Aviv. If the Palestinians want to get more water, we have to enlarge the kirk. Maybe that what is happening today, and I'll come back to it. The other biggest problem, I would say that most of the Israelis, including the leadership in Israel, they are not aware of what is happening in the West Bank. A good example, what they just saw. This happened, you know, I've seen it, you know, with the late Sahak Rabin in 95. He was not aware, you know, until an Israeli TV program was made about Bethlehem, about Hebron, compared to Ephrat. Then he realized and ordered, you know, to supply more water, but for that was for a short period. Even when I was working with the municipality, I had to deal with the civil administration on daily basis, especially when we were closing roads for installing pipes. 
And all the time, the civil administration officers would ask me, Madam, why there is no water? Why all the time you complain? And then I have to go tell them that, you know, we have no control. Mikarot is controlling everything. We are left with the surplus. Because the situation that time per capita is the same like today. And this is, I think, also because of the politics, you know. All the time it is a blaming. Now, when we meet, I blame him, he blames me. Israelis will blame us like somebody, you know, uh, ministers called the Palestinians, you know, they are creating an intifada of sewage. He's not linking why that is happening. It's not because we don't want to build, you know, a treatment. There are other complications, and he should really uh, read and realize the truth. But anyway, I think today we are closer than ever before in terms of a final agreement on what. Even in the early days, in the 50s, and in the Jordan River in particular, the Arabs and the Israelis agreed there was a technical agreement how to share the Jordan River Basin water. The unified agreement, the Johnston Plan, Johnston came after the Tunisia Water Valley Authority, you know, to uh, expand their knowledge to the Middle East. But that agreement was never politically endorsed. Now, when it comes to Palestine and Israel, first, the cake is much bigger today. Why? Because the technology, because of the desalination. Desalination in Israel today is cheaper than abstracting the groundwater from Bethlehem, from southeast Bethlehem, where you have to go 900 meters deep in the ground to reach the groundwater. In Israel today, it is 52 cents at Ashkelon plant per cubic meter. Each cubic meter is like 250 gallons. So, keeping the water, which is also at the same time, it is a basic human right. Nobody, if you take it from that angle, will deny. But if you start talking about needs and rights, and that's where we are stuck today. The official two sides, you know, the Palestinians talk about water rights, which was the first thing in Oslo Agreement, Article 40, Israel recognizes the Palestinian water rights. The Israel say, tell us your needs. And the PA today buys more than 55 million cubic meters from Mikorot. But that's what now we want. We want first to know what is ours. Then, if we have deficit, we will think. Even the President Abu Mazen mentioned this to us. We met with him about a year ago. Once we settle this conflict, we need uh, more water. Will not uh, hesitate buying water from Ashkelon or ask the Israelis to build a plant and uh, sell that water to us or build it in Gaza. But the question is still, you know, water is linked to the others, and why water has been kept a hostage that we cannot understand. Now, reaching an agreement on water, and some people, you know, Odette, you know, if I met Odette two years ago probably, or in the 90s when he was negotiating, his tone could be different because he was not aware of the reality. For the Palestinians, the sanitary problem, you know, it is a lose-lose. If we do not invest in improving the sanitation, all the, the sewage will infiltrate to the groundwater, and Israel will be the first one to suffer. Today they are suffering because it's flowing in open valleys. But because Israel is the, has the lion's share, it's 80% of the renewable groundwater is consumed either inside Israel or by settlements. So it will be a lose-lose. And for the Palestinians, there will be no natural water resources available if we do not protect it. So by working together to protect, I'm not working you know, to make a favor for the Israelis. I'm working to secure fresh water for the next Palestinian generations. We want to leave something for our kids. In Gaza, it's another story. And today, the UN, B'Tselem, everybody knows that by 2015, there will be no fresh water available in Gaza. This was not something new. In '95, when I was working on creating the PWA and we've done assessment for Gaza, we said by 2015, the natural resources in Gaza will be gone for many reasons. And the PA is interfering now to build a desalination plant. Now also, there is a big gap, I think, and our friends here from Bethlehem, they know this probably more than uh, many of us, you know, the cultural things or the terminology, you know. 
how do we speak with each other? Maybe over the years I have learned, you know, and understood the language. But the language of the other is very important. In 92, when I wrote a book with Elisha Kali, who was from the far right on water, because we introduced a new terminology, like, you know, minimum uh, water requirements per capita. So let's say rights or yours. The same thing in the Jordanian Israeli peace treaty. The new words were created and yes, how to go over these problems. So I think today, and we have the Palestinian minister coming to talk about Brooklyn's tomorrow thing. He's very open. He gets all the support of the PA. The speech of Abu Mazin last week in New York. I think the Palestinian leadership is very sincere. And we can go for water. We don't want to delink it. That's very important because Oslo was for five years and now we see the consequences. And it is a taboo for every Palestinian, you know, that they are worried about this. As I was calling Sebi for comprehensive everything or nothing, the same. But we think water is one of the five issues. It can be solved. And it would bring support to both leaderships. For the Palestinians, every single house will enjoy more water and will feel the difference and become more supportive to the leadership. Also for Israel, it shows and proves even to the Palestinians that and the international world, they are sincere in this peace process. And that will be a push up and builds, you know, uh, the optimism among many people who are pessimistic nowadays and it brings more hope. And we think it is doable and it can be done even today before tomorrow, if there is the right will and the strong leadership who can take these decisions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm feeling more optimistic already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Annie. Happy to be here, really, and about Jordan's perspective, Annie, I always see Jordan as Malcolm in the middle, really, literally what's happening here. But. Um, um, we feel that we always been held hostage to the conflict in Jordan. And uh, we felt this during the many years of uh, trying to reach a peace uh, agreement. Uh, back in uh, the uh, mid 90s when we signed the peace agreement and we waited for the Palestinian peace agreement to take place, People had their spirits up, uh, the economy was very good and so on, but when it failed, everything failed with it. Also in the year 2000, uh, uh, people felt very, very encouraged with the Camp David. And things were wonderful at that time with the stall of the Camp David and the entrance of the Second Intifada. It was devastating for Jordan. Uh, the, the problem of Jordan that uh, um, challenges uh, never ending, um, it's always uh, something in the area that impact Jordan in a way or another. Today, about three years ago or four years ago, uh, Jordan started this DC uh, conveyable uh, uh, conduit to bring water from the southern uh, part of Jordan to Amman, and we thought excellent the water situation will be uh, finally um, okay. People will receive water not only once a week, but twice or three times a week. And here comes the Syrians. We received more than one million uh, refugees all of a sudden, you know, within a year time in Jordan. And we have to provide the, the water for them, um, uh, plus everything else, uh, energy, food, and whatever. And the last, uh, Reports I read that Jordan receives only 30% as an international aid to uh, support the uh, refugees uh, in the country. But it's the, the, the hopes are up always. Neither use the term that if you are not optimistic in the Middle East, you will definitely have a heart attack. So uh, we always optimistic. We look at uh, the cooperation uh, with, the, with the Israel and uh, Palestine on the rehabilitation of the Jordan River as a very, very important one because no one country can rehabilitate the Jordan. The Jordan is facing huge challenges like everybody knows. And like you know, the, the Jordan main problem is the diversion of water. Diversion of water by Israel in the beginning and then 
uh, followed by uh, the Syrians and the Jordanians. Palestinians have absolutely no uh, um, part in uh, demising uh, the river, which impacted the Dead Sea so much. But there is a very strong political message the Palestinians are giving right now is that they want to have a very big major role in rehabilitating the river. They want to join us in rehabilitating the river to, uh, so they send the message that yes, it is our river and one day we will be uh, um, on the river shore to uh, uh, use all the benefits from there. And there are many benefits if we rehabilitate the river. Any one of the uh, main benefits I look at is uh, maybe we can uh, um, get rid of this uh, obsession called the Red Dead Canal in the region. I don't know how many people know about the Red Dead Canal, but it's a project to bring the water from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea in order to save the Dead Sea and then uh, um, uh, produce uh, drinking water or desalination, which it's totally uh, observed, really. The, the water will be uh, cost so much. Okay, we need water, but at what cost? Um, uh, rehabilitating the river might contribute a bit of uh, uh, the World Bank and the three governments to ease up on this uh, mega project that will devastate the region. Um, the other uh, benefits that uh, the people of the uh, um, the valley itself will be benefiting. One project that we are really after in uh, in uh, Jordan and Israel is the uh, Peace Park, we call it, where the Yarmouk River enters on the Jordan River, and uh, over there we can uh, develop the uh, area very well. We call it the Bakura in in, uh, in Jordan, which. Uh, uh, it used to have the first hydro power station, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Palestine Electric <coughs> Company, which was built by a, an immigrant Jew, uh, Ben Has Rothenberg, who became a pillar of the uh, building the uh, modern Israel right now. So um, uh, it's a very, very nice and beautiful area that if it's developed, it can be uh, uh, marked as a, a uh, the first uh, joint uh, uh, eco park or uh, or a peace park in the region between Jordan and uh, Israel, and you can imagine how many jobs will uh, create and the cooperation there. Uh, finally, and uh, Jordan have a lot of interest in rehabilitating the river, and at the end, the whole country is named after the river, and we should not accept for the river to stay as an open sewage really. I don't want to take more time so we open up more. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, oh, we started a bit late so um, I'm, uh, I'm thinking we should allow ourselves 20 minutes uh, for Q&A before we conclude. So um, just uh, raise your hand. Sir? Hi, I'm Rafael Gazinger, consultant at the And if I may, uh, quick questions to three of the speakers, very quick. Uh, to Gidon, my question is uh, uh, what's the water, average water consumption of Israel, and how much does Israel get, in, including most of desalination and natural salinities left over for, for Jordan and for the Palestinians? For Munkaf, you said that the Red Dead thing is not really feasible in terms of the water. Can you explain why? Because it seems in the face of it, that because of the difference in the height, it would be noise. really very, uh, makes a lot of sense, seems to be in there, yes. so it makes a lot of sense. And to another about Gaza, uh, what about the dissemination plan? Is it going to happen, and what's going to happen there? So, um, uh, in relation to uh, uh, water consumption, in Israel, uh, water consumption averages at about 320 liters per person per day. Uh, and that includes all municipal uh, use, while in Palestine it averages between 70 to 100 meters per person per day, so the discrepancy is, uh, is three, a little bit more than three, uh, between three and four. Um, uh, as far as today, there is excess water, and it's not coming from Friends of the Middle East, it's coming from the Israeli Water Commissioner uh, that's coming and saying that Israel has today excess water, we would like to think that it's because of the efforts of Friends of the Middle East that fresh water is finally uh, being released down the Jordan River. 
we think it's partly, but it's also because of the excess water. Um, so uh, the, the combination of desal and the treatment of wastewater have really changed the reality on the ground. We think that there are many more measures. Um, it, it doesn't have to be just more and more desal, although it appears to be the easy option. We could be uh, uh, even f uh, you know, more efficient in how we use water. So we're in the Middle East. We flush our toilets with fresh water. Uh, we could be flushing our toilets with grey water and save 200 million cubic meters of water in Israel alone. So as we go down that path, of greater efficiency, wiser water use expanding, uh, that makes it so much more politically viable uh, to share more fairly the shared water. And you know, that, that's not doing a favor. We're not talking about doing a favor. That's, a, that's Palestinians getting their fair rights. But it just makes it with a, uh, uh, with a lower political cost that wasn't there two years ago. And I think that's the significance of this, of the opportunity of why coming to a final agreement on water today. Because the political cost is so low, yet the political gain is so high. Okay, Red Dead Canal, this is, you know, with pleasure I can talk about this. A bit of topography first, you know, because um, like you say, a lot of people think uh, the, the lowest point on earth and it'll be easy to let the water flow and uh, even build uh, um, uh, hydropower. Uh, between the Gulf of Aqaba and the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, there are a, a hills that goes up to 200 meters. Okay. So uh, in order to take the water from the uh, Gulf of Aqaba, you need to pump water up to 200 and then let it flow uh, naturally or by gravity to the uh, to the Dead Sea. Uh, this sector alone to take the water from the Gulf up to the uh, a place called the Rishi in Wadi Araba will require about 900 megawatts to pump uh, uh, the 2 billion cubic meters required. Okay. So uh, that, that alone is an impact, the energy impact. And uh, either Jordan or Israel does not have that much power in that area over there. Now, uh, uh, to take the water from that point downwards, okay, they built a uh, power station or a hydro power station and it will generate 135 megawatt. Another one, down the line will generate 116 megawatt. These power generated will be used to desalination by the Dead Sea. But to pump the fresh water you already generated in the Dead Sea to Amman, which is now about 1,400 meters head, you will need, at the beginning, 1,100 megawatt of power to pump that water about 200 uh, million cubic meters. Uh, at the maturity of the um, uh, project where it will produce the 550 uh, cubic meters of water, you will need 3,000 megawatts. So it's, uh, okay, fine, we want the water, we, we would like to have extra water, but at what cost? This is only one aspect of the Red Dead. Now, uh, the, the uh, the other component for the Red Dead is to save the Dead Sea. And when you take the brine and put it in the Dead Sea, uh, uh, scientific reports, and all this comes from the report of the World Bank, it's not our studies ourselves, any, or all these numbers comes from the report itself. Now when you let the water go by surface, okay, and to, to let it flow to the Dead Sea, a gypsum uh, uh, formation will take place. Uh, when you mix the marine water with the uh, Dead Sea water. Now, um, if the gypsum uh, stayed on, on uh, the surface, in, in, um, uh, any, uh, it, it will be like the ice uh, bergs, you know, like floating in the, in the North Pole. Or, and, uh, exactly, and it will sink at the end, but more will form. 
And if it stayed as particles, it will change the characteristic of the water itself from royal blue to Milky Way, you know, in, in the water, and it will change the whole uh, idea of the Dead Sea. It will impact tourism so heavily. Now, if you are not, you know, if they want to avoid this, they will have to pump the brine about 100 meter deep under the surface of the Dead Sea. And I, I don't know how, how much energy you need to pump that much water under the, the Dead Sea. So this is only any, um, I don't want to take long by explaining why not the uh, environmentally and, and uh, the, uh, the risk of building such a mega project in a very seismic area. It's, um, it's the Rift Valley for God's sake. Andy, so. You're saying the Rift is dead. Oh, of course it is. I never believed it myself. He was never born. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick remark about you know the consumption. You know, I receive water on average in Bethlehem once every three weeks, and with my two brothers who live in the same building, we have tanks on the roofs with a storage capacity of more than ten thousand gallons, and sometimes we run out of water if it takes more than three weeks. And there are parts like Hebron area or Gavarnai. There are communities do not get buy water from the municipality from May to October. They have to buy it by tankers, which becomes more expensive. And in a place where we work like Yatta, from the municipality, the people get like 20, 17 to 20 liters per day. And just to enjoy a good hygienic level, you need about 120 liters per day, according to the WHO guidelines. Uh, the other thing about this, the red dead, you know, we are not against it only because of the uh, economic feasibility, but it's going to change the, both the chemical and physical characteristics of the Dead Sea. Monte <coughs> talked about the gypsum, which will float and create a solid crust on top of water. The color will change because the difference of salinity, the Dead Sea is 10 times more. And also it will emit, you know, uh, <laughs> smells like the rotten eggs because of the sulfur. So we will lose the Dead Sea as, you know, a sea. Because of that, it is too dangerous. So from environmental perspective, which we as an organization with USA, half million dollars in 2005, we came almost with the same results that the World Bank has to put 16 and half million dollars for it. That's it. And today they are thinking about another pilot, you know, desalination in Aqaba, give to Elad and the Negev for Israel and Israel will give more water from the Sea of Galilee. The Palestinians are against if it is to be connected with the Dead Sea because we want also our share and the Palestinians are demanding either more water from the Sea of Galilee or from the north that can be siphoned in different ways or build a desalination plant for a blackish water near uh, the Dead Sea shores, in particular near El Pashka. Now about Gaza, yani as said, you know, the Gazans as a human beings, they are entitled to drink, you know, healthy water. And there have been different <coughs> discussions, as I said, you know, water from Egypt, and nowadays the desalination. The capital uh, cost for this plant is about half a billion, <laughs> 500 million dollars. And I think the Islamic Development Bank promised 250 million dollars. Now for me, you know, the question is not only about money, because this would require in itself a special station for energy. How we are going to get that power? And before that, the first desalination plant was built in Gaza by the Israeli civil administration in Deir al-Balah before they handed Gaza in 94 to the PA. And that plant was shut immediately after the Israeli withdrawal uh, at that time. Why? Because for desalination, you would require chemicals. And there are so many chemicals are banned to enter Palestine today, including the chemicals needed for the tanneries. And get on, or they, they know about it. So to build this plant, and you have the siege, you, don't, you cannot get the chemicals, you don't have energy, uh, you have, don't have the skilled capacity, and the spare parts. Unfortunately, even the Egyptians refused to build this plant on the Egyptian side and give the water to Gaza. So it is a very, very risky uh, plant, and you know there should be other creative solution. And until that, the Gazans will continue to suffer. 
It's not something new. I work in Gaza from 93 to 97, and every time I had to take the water to our office from Jerusalem. So in Gaza, it is, yani, the word catastrophe is not enough when it comes to water. Daughter, just when you erased my optimism. 